In the cold light of dawn in France, two French airmen, Nangesa and Coley, leave on a flight on which they hope to make history. For this was meant to be the first Atlantic flight from east to west. Out they went into that dawn sky, westward over the cliffs of Boulogne and out over the wide Atlantic. And that was the last anyone ever saw of them. The Atlantic, still the master, a waste of water not to be conquered easily. Then other brave men, this time Americans, Lieutenant Commander Noel Davis and Lieutenant Worcester in their seven-ton plane American Legion. But they crashed on a practice flight. Another attempt on the Atlantic ends in disaster. Charles A. Lindbergh, a 25-year-old American in his tiny monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis. There was a 5,000-pound prize for the first to cross over the Atlantic in a single-engine plane without radio. Others, like Chamberlain and Acosta, were ready to go. To be first, there was no time to lose. So, one dawn, after a worried night without sleep, waiting for the weather to improve, Charles Lindbergh gassed up his plane to the brim and made ready. A flask of coffee, some sandwiches, a plane load of petrol and faith. That's all he started with. To those watching, it was a terrifying takeoff, for it seemed as though the fuel-laden plane would never get off the waterlogged ground and would end in flaming disaster against the trees. But somehow it got off, and those who watch prayed that his luck would hold like that all the way. That morning, the world went about its business as though Charles A. Lindbergh had never been heard of. Alone, the spirit of St. Louis flew out over the eastern seaboard of America, and as his native land receded, no doubt Charles Lindbergh wondered if that was the last time he would ever see it. Before him, thousands of miles of immensity, a mighty wilderness of cloud and sea. No place for a man to be alone in, his life dependent on one tiny, throbbing little motor. In London, New York, and Paris that afternoon, they didn't think much about Charles Lindbergh. The evening papers brought the brief news of his last known whereabouts. That was all. And in those night theater crowds, few passed remark about that lonely chap out there over the Atlantic. Neither in London, nor in New York, nor in that city he had planned as his destination, Paris. Yet when dawn came over the wilderness, that little motor was still throbbing, and still the great castles of cloud held the lonely voyager. Sky and sea, sea and sky. He never saw a ship, though beneath him there must have been many. Ships, forging their safe, secure way over the wilderness, with all the devices known to men. Radio keeping in touch, passengers in complete comfort enjoying themselves, mighty engines making short work of the miles, mightier engines than there up with Charles Lindbergh. Mist, rain, fog, and fast emptying fuel tanks. And then land the west coast of Ireland. That evening in Paris, they had news now, and they knew he was coming. At Le Bourget, his target, the newsreels put up their lights and thousands began to gather to wait for hours in excited anticipation. 
to wait for the sound of one tiny little motor. In the nearby city, Paris was her usual bright, sparkling self. Theatres, clubs and night spots were as full as ever. History or no history, Paris remains Paris. But now, in the darkness at Le Bourget, thousands have swelled to yet more thousands. On the airfield, the crowd was uncontrollable. Paris and the world has never seen anything like it. And then, is that an airplane engine? Is it? Yes. No. But yes. Then, lost in a wild, cheering, milling mob, an airman tired beyond belief, bewildered beyond belief at all that was happening as they bore him in. After 33 and a half hours of lonely flight, the spirit of St. Louis had arrived. Next morning in Paris, the word was Lindbergh, Lindbergh, we must see Lindbergh. A young man in a borrowed suit appeared on the balcony of the American Embassy, took bow after bow and made wave after wave, still bewildered. A day or so later, he flew to London, to Croydon. And here again, he was overwhelmed at the way that he was received. Although Alcock and Brown had conquered the Atlantic back in 1919, no one could deny that this was Lindbergh's moment. The man who conquered loneliness as well as the Atlantic. A time to consider just how far we'd gone and how far we were now going. The same year, 1927, but a new gleaming shape, the Supermarine Schneider trophy plane in which designer Mitchell displayed the future as he saw it. The same year, 1927, Britain's first great aircraft carrier moves out to sea, the future again. The same year, 1927, already airliners carrying passengers in comfort many miles to their business. But in everything, there always has to be a first time. Take my dead and light the light. I'll arrive late tonight, Blackbird. Bye-bye.